Baik, kita mulai. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wabihi nasta'inu ala umuri dunia wadin. Salat wassalamu ala asrafil ambiya wal mursalin. Wa ala alihi wa sohbihi ajma'in. Wa man tabi'ahu bi'iksanin ila yaumidin. Uh, yang kami hormati, Profesor Samsul Arifin sebagai Wakil Rektor Satu Bidang Akademik dan Pengembangan AIK Universitas Muhammadiyah Malang. Uh, our Distinguished Guys, uh, Profesor Nuraisa Abdurrahman, uh, juga Profesor uh, Master Hilmi, saya sudah bergabung atau belum, <laughs> Mas Arif, uh, dari Koper Taes, <coughs> Koordinator Perguruan Tinggi Agama Islam 4, dan sekaligus menjadi pembicara pada kesempatan hari ini, Dekan Fai, Dr. Khozin, para pejabat struktural di lingkungan Fakultas Agama Islam Untas Muhammadiyah Malang, dan khususnya lagi teman-teman uh, di Prodi Hukum Keluarga Islam yang telah menyelenggarakan kegiatan ini. Alhamdulillah pada pagi hari ini kita pada akhirnya berkesempatan untuk melaksanakan kegiatan yang sudah dirancang cukup lama. Mudah-mudahan kegiatan pada pagi hari ini akan berjalan dengan baik. Nah, pada kesempatan kali ini saya akan memandu kegiatan dan sekaligus menjadi moderator dalam kegiatan ini dan mari bersama-sama kita mengawali atau membuka uh, seminar pada pagi hari ini dengan membaca basmalah bersama-sama Bismillahirrahmanirrahim uh, kemudian for the second program is the recitation of the Holy Quran yang akan disampaikan oleh Saudara Abdul Rahim kepada Saudara Abdul Rahim, uh, ready? You you are there? Oke, okay, saya persilahkan. Ready. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A'udzu billahi minasy syaithanir rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Ya
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Assalamualaikum. Terima kasih kepada saudara Abdul Rahim. The next program will be uh, welcoming remark and opening the program that will be delivered by Profesor Samsul Arifin, uh, Vice Rector One. University of Muhammadiyah Malang. To Professor Samsul Arifin, time is yours. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sometimes I call him Mas Pradana Boy. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, informal meeting, but because we are meeting with in a formal meeting, I call him Pak Boy. <laughs> Thank you, Pak Boy. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. berkatuh. Innal hamdulillah la haula wa la quwwata illa billah asyhadu an la ilaha illallah wa asyhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu nabiyyu wa ba'da. Rabbishrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul 'uqdatam min lisani yaqahu qawli. The honorable all of speakers. I want to say hello to Professor Nor Aisha. Jabatan. I, I forgot the position. Jabatan. Pengajian Melayu. Oh, Jabatan Pengajian Melayu. Yeah. <laughs> Malay Studies. Yeah. I confused about the term of Jabatan yeah, because uh, in Indonesia Jabatan is like uh, structural position. Yeah, this Jabatan, uh, <laughs> like yeah. Sanjil or Vice Rector, or like uh, Pak Boy position of Vice Dean yeah, in the Faculty of Islamic Studies, and also the distinguished speakers, uh, Professor Master Hilmi, Pak Hilmi ada ya Professor Hilmi. Belum, Belum ya. Ya, yeah. and the honorable the dean and all of vice dean and also the head of the department of uh, Ahwalustasia. First of all, let's say alhamdulillahirobbilalamin because uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala always uh, bestow the health and the blessing to us so that we can gather. In the, I think is a extraordinary forum, academic forum. So on behalf of uh, rectors and Silor, uh, I'm so sorry because the uh, rector cannot uh, with us. I already met him. Uh, rector asked me to represent, represent him yeah, to deliver the opening remark because in the same time, Pak Rektor has the another agenda. Even though, yeah, even though <laughs> I also have uh, another agenda and another agenda to to, to deliver the opening remark in uh, LPPI. LPPI, what in English, Mas Boy? LPPI, Lembaga Pengembangan Publication, eh? yeah. <laughs> Publication Center. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, LPPI, the Institute of, apa itu? The Institute for, for Publication. 
yeah for the publication for the, publication for the development of the oh. scientific publication yeah i see uh, one again the, on behalf of the director i would like to give the, the high appreciation for this seminar because uh, international conference i think we can take the same benefit to the conference of course uh, uh, this seminar is indicate yeah, that uh, the faculty of islamic studies especially the, the department of the Holosasia can keep the academic atmosphere. Yeah. I think it's the first benefit that we can take to, from this forum. And the second benefit, hopefully we can develop. Yeah. We can develop the networking with the, another institution in the abroad, especially with the, uh, the great professor like uh, Nor Aisha and also <laughs> Professor Master Hilmi. Yeah. So I think we can uh, take some benefit uh, to from this 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 forum. So one again, thank you uh, to, to the all of uh, committee here and uh, enjoy the the conference. I think that all, uh, Mas Boy. Uh, so uh, let's say Basmala together. To start this conference, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, thank you. I should move to the next agenda because the opening here will start. Yeah, thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. 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 Prof. Ya, terima kasih. We say thanks very much for to Prof. Samsul Arifin for his remark and opening. So we now continue to the next agenda. There will be. Uh, Remark or prepares from Professor Master Hilmi. Uh, is he already here? Uh, so I have to inform you that Professor Master Hilmi is head of. He is a rector uh, at State Islamic University Sunan Ampel Surabaya, but at the same time, he is also head. Of or coordinator for what we can say in 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 English, yeah, coordinating body for Islamic private uh, universities, right? in 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 Isyafa. So in this case, uh, he he will he he, he plays two roles. <laughs> so actually, we want to give him uh, a chance to to deliver his remark as. Coordinator Copper Tai Sempat before he delivers the speech or the presentation today. Uh, Kasenan, Pak pa Master already here? Oh no, Pak pa Boy, Mas Boy. Okay. Yeah, bro. Excuse me, uh, my I, I, I withdrawal from from this screen, yeah. Okay, I, I, okay, bro. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Ya, Waalaikum. Terima Okay. Not yet, Pak uh, Pradana, because I think he has problem with the traffic jam. It's very, you know, frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> so, Prof. Master will be will be here physically or join us? <laughs> uh, oh, just, oh, oh, from uh, from online. his house to the office, yeah, maybe. Okay, okay. Then while we are waiting, uh, Prof. Master, so later we will give him a uh, time for for remark and presentation. At the same time, <laughs> so we next to uh, we we move to next agenda. The so our topic today is about uh, Islamic family law in the context of minority. So in Indonesia, especially in the context of post New Order period, we can see how Islamic law uh, extend, and also we can see many Muslims. Muslim groups that aspiring to to the extension of Islamic law to the public uh, area. As we can see, actually, Islamic personal law uh, has been implemented in Indonesia through the uh, codification or the legislation of uh, religious code in 1989. And then uh, the compilation of Uh, Islamic legal, uh, what you can see, Islamic legal thought or fikih, yeah, uh, which actually represent 
the views of Indonesian fiqh. If we if we talk about kompilasi hukum Islam and ask the expert or those who are involved in the in the formulation of kompilasi hukum Islam, so whether this fiqh are Safi'i, Hanafi, Habali, or other, they actually uh, uh, suggest that this is Indonesian fiqh. <laughs> so the based on so many madhab, so it is not exclusively exclusively Safi'i, although maybe uh, the books or reference they are they 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 use at that time mostly Safi'i. But then if we refer to for example Kiai Sahal Mahfud's uh, remark in one of uh, book about uh, social fiqh, he said that the uh, extensive reference to Safi'i is not due to the uh prioritiz prioritizing prioritizing safi'i of other madhab but this is uh, merely about technical thing that uh, safi'i books are circulated more in south east asia than others <laughs> so uh but then in the context of post new order period we can see how muslim groups as we can see just yesterday uh 212 reunion is uh, it is political actually, but to me, uh, this also part of how uh, Muslims aspiration toward the formalization of Sharia and the extension of uh, Sharia uh, field, not only in the context of Muslim personal law or family law, but also to the context of uh, public law. And now our topic will be related to minorities and personal law uh, in the context of my modernities and professor Aisha is also uh, uh, one expert in this context uh, she writes a lot about this topic and uh, maybe we can also see to compare how Singaporean context and take any comparative uh, perspective on Indonesian context. I have also a very interesting case here. Yeah? Uh, for example, uh, this semester I teach uh, around 10 students from Singapore. <laughs> so okay. they, they are taking Master of Law in, in, uh, at our university, Muhammadiyah University. And within this uh, program, not Islamic law actually, but law, uh, and then I teach one, one, one subject they call uh, modern issues or contemporary issues in Islamic law. And uh, for presentation, I give them freedom to talk anything they feel interested, <laughs> interesting mm -hmm. for, for the context. So one of student uh, already presents about the uh, Islamic law in Singapore, including personal law. Uh, in Singapore, it was very interesting because we can see many differences and also many similarities in both contexts. So, without further ado, I will give time to Professor Aisha to deliver his uh, presentation. Professor, time is yours. Terima kasih, uh, uh, Pradana. Then, um, first, let me uh, thank. Uh, all of you who are here today, especially, of course, Prof. Shamsul Arifin, and then also Prof. Master Hilmi, and of course, uh, Pradana. I mean, we have had a long contact with Pradana, so thank you very much. And also, Mas Hasnan, thank you so much for inviting me here. And of course, all the other distinguished scholars from uh, uh, University Muhammadiyah Malang who are here today. And my student and all you students who are here, um, hopefully you know we will like uh, your Prof Pradana has said that we will learn uh, the experience of uh, Muslim personal law and its implementation in Singapore, and that you can you know think about how the points and issues that I will raise in this lecture may be useful to you, even though right in in Indonesia of course not like in the case of Singapore, the Muslims are the majority. So even though we are minority, there may be issues that, uh, you know, that we can relate to 
uh, our common experiences here uh, may provide a basis for rethinking uh, the direction of the Muslim law as, as applicable to us. So also let me uh, clarify that I'm not uh, an expert on Islamic law. I'm not a professor on Islamic law, but my research expertise has much to do with the administration of the Muslim law in Singapore and Southeast Asia, especially Malaysia and Indonesia. I also teach this subject apart from having written on these uh, aspects. Also for my master's, uh, I also looked at Malay customary laws, right? Adat, hukum adat, but in the context of the Malay states, uh, what we call Malaysia today. So yeah, uh, okay, so let, let me try and share screen here. Okay. Okay, can you all see the screen? Okay, so this uh, presentation is actually based on my paper that was published in the German Law Journal in 2019. So I try to extract uh, the major points and issues that can provide a basis for our discussion. So it's not really a lecture that I have presented in terms of a paper. What I've done is I've extracted some of the salient arguments from this paper and make it into slide form so that it'll be uh, inshallah, easier for us to, to um, focus on the major points. Okay, so let me first start by talking about my approach. Right, uh, as I said, I am not a, a, an expert on Islamic law, as in the study of, you know, the mashabs and the methodology, and neither am I a theologian. Right, by training, you can say that I am a socio. Uh, I'm I, I am familiar with the tradition of sociology of law. So the way I approach the study of uh, Muslim personal law may be different from many of you here who uh, you know, are trained right, to understand uh, Muslim legal history in a different way. Okay? So essentially, what does this socio-historical approach uh, entails in the study of law? It does not look at law uh, as a body of fixed rules right, uh, encapsulated in legal texts and uh, that you know, one can easily turn to to understand uh, the law, right? Um, of course, law are compiled in legal texts. They are written in legal texts, but the sociology of law makes it necessary for us, compels us to understand that literal uh, stipulations in text will not be effective or objective or comprehensive enough to understand what the law entails right, for people. So whatever the law is that you, you refer it to, whether it's Islamic law, Muslim personal law, or general law, basically the approach en enables us or expects us to understand law within specific social, political, economic, and historical contexts. And that you know, uh, law is not devoid of group interests, right? Of group uh, orientations, of groups' value orientations. So every law, even what we call Muslim personal law or Sharia law or Islamic law, all these laws are the product also of human conceptualization and human ideology, human group thinking and their valuations, in which determine what they, how they see the law, which determines what they select of, their, of these laws as relevant to their people today, and also which determines their understanding of these laws. So the whole idea is that we are understanding laws not as isolated from society. Uh, laws are seen as you know, the product of evolution and adaptation and change and modification to the needs and conditions of society. And this society that we are talking about is not a vague society, it's a concrete society. And the impact of the law, what is the law has to be understood in the concrete context of that society and that frame of reference. So essentially this approach avoids uh, any, any kind of you know, overgeneralization about the Muslim law or any other laws, because it expects you to understand the specific law that you are talking about, the specific system, within a specific context, within a specific environment, right? Uh, and, and within a specific society at a specific time. And also, we, we, you know, it allows us to understand that not everything can be understood by text-bound law. 
to understand and to have a better appreciation of the law. We have to understand how the law is actually understood by people, how the law is actually applied and the impact of that law on society. So this approach helps us to open the doors to history in understanding legal thought, whatever that legal tradition and thought is, even including Islamic law. It also enables us to identify the relevant agencies and stakeholders in determining and conditioning that law. It also enables us to understand that there are competing thought about laws, right? Because we are looking at how laws are created and how they evolve. And also it enables us to evaluate the law in the context of that society. That means it enables us to see whether this law is actually fulfilling the objectives, principles that are universal, that are standards that most societies, Western or Muslim, would accept as good, as good law or good principles. Um, so that's about the socio-historical uh, approach uh, briefly. And then I also want to say that, um, um, that you know, all societies today, right, uh, that including Muslim societies, are in the stage of transition, right? This is very important because we have we cannot understand law if we cannot understand the nature of our society, the process in which our society is going through. And all societies today, not excluding the Muslim societies, are in the stage of transition. They are transiting from a traditional society that is pre-modern, pre-capitalistic, pre-industrial, to one that is impacted by change. Of course, this change is a very mass, a uh, very broad term, but the change involves, you know, or is the result of the process of industrialization, of modernization, and of globalization with the advent of technological advancement. So we are all going through this change. And this direction of change, every society attempts to direct their change towards uh, achieving the application and assimilation of modern knowledge and technology to raise standards of living and to promote industry and resources, economic resources for the development of that society. So all societies are undergoing this, right? Uh, they are trying to develop and in the process, they are assimilating modern knowledge and technology. And this has created a lot of changes to their institutions, their basic institutions, which includes law, which includes family, and also includes the very structure of the society, right? The structure of the society is breaking down. Uh, there is a movement away from the old social groupings, right? Village communities, religious communities, and society, members of the society is slowly being assimilated into a modern nation state. So this state is a new thing, right? It is quite an abstract uh, concept, uh, not, not, not the case previously. And you see also the process towards democratization of the social order or the social system in which we live. So previously, most of our societies are governed by a traditional political system, a traditional social system based on patrimonialism or feudalism. But and where the king right, uh, is the source and fountain of justice and rights and laws, etc., cetera, uh, very much uh, his sovereignty. But today, you see a movement away from that kind of a social structure to one that uh, is more democratic, in which right, there, is a, there is a great emphasis on, or greater emphasis on individual human rights, right? And that you have, you see the development of, you know, uh, conventions, human rights conventions at the global plane, which is ratified by many, many states, right? Because there is this trend towards a greater consciousness and greater emphasis on individual rights and the protection and their safeguards. Uh, also, you know, change also means that our society is becoming more complex. Our society is becoming more pluralistic, right? Because you have movements of people, right? Not just uh, from one level of the society to another, the mobility allows us to move up the social ladder, but also mobility allows us to uh, facilitate migration. 
So as a result, you have more people coming into our respective countries today, making our societies more complex, and of course, changing the structure of our society. We have now a greater middle class, unlike previously, right? And uh, and also this, uh, the, the ones at the lower bottom of the society may have the ability to move up the socioeconomic ladder. Right? So all these changes are happening uh, to us. There is definitely a breakdown of, or rather a challenge to our basic social uh, traditional institutions, whether it's political or social or educational or legal, and that we are all moving towards this transition. And in the process, of course, uh, we are, you know, tradition becomes still very important to us. So although we are moving, right, we know that we are still anchoring our, our change, right, to aspects of our tradition that we deem to be important and relevant. Because without that tradition, which is shaped by our values, right, our religion, our, our philosophy, etc., coming from various sources, Without that tradition, we are lost, right? So the tradition helps us, guides us. It's a very uh, deep-rooted in our, in our consciousness, right? Uh, it helps us to mark our identity as a people. It guides us towards change. And it also helps to uh, alleviate and cushion the impact of some of these changes that may not be uh, very constructive to the well-being of our society. So tradition helps us to move on. And of course, law is part of this tradition, right? So until today, we embody or we, you know, we still revere, we cherish the legal traditions from the past, right? Include also other, other traditions or religious traditions or cultural traditions. We, we, catch, we embody this and we still hold on to it in our attempts to adapt to all these changes. And in this context of change, of course, the ideology and the function of the elite becomes crucial, right? In any efforts at change, right? It is the leaders in every domain of society that will play the most important role in terms of envisioning the direction of change, in terms of, you know, uh, analyzing, identifying problems, which, you know, needs to be addressed so that this adjustment to change becomes constructive becomes positive. So the elites and intelligentsia in, in our society, in all domains, right, plays that very important role. Of course, in the domain of law, right, in the domain of law, um, the elites in that domain are important. But what are these elites? No longer in the domain of law can the elites merely be theologians, right, or even strict legal uh, intelligentsia. Because law has become more complex, Law, you know, uh, needs the support and needs the, the participation of many other elites, our cultural elites, our educational elites, our political elites, to enable us to create the law that we think will have good impact on society. So even the nature of the elite is, is something that's changing, right? Because of the, of the society changing, the complexities of social problems, social issues and challenges, the elites in one domain is not enough, right? So theologians cannot in sufficiently play that role of the elites in the domain of the law, in the Muslim law, for example, or other religious laws, right? The theologian has to work with other uh, domain experts, even uh, maybe educationists, right? Even uh, social workers maybe, because they need to understand how that law will affect people's lives. And therefore, the consultation with other experts become important, just like in the case of medical advancement, right? If, a, if you need to pass a fatwa on this issue today, surely it cannot just be the purview of the theologians any longer, because the theologians require the information from the legal, uh, the, the medical experts on that particular uh, area that they are trying to determine the legality of, right? Similarly, they need also the experts from the cultural uh, domain because the impact of this fatwa on people's lives will have will be able to bet, better advised by the elites in that domain. So the function and ideology of the elite intelligentsia means must be more must be more um, 
interactive. They cannot just be uh, confined to the exclusive domains as society becomes more complex. And then you also have, of course, the nation state as a contextual framework of rights, lawmaking and administration of justice for all of us today, whether we are minority communities or majority communities, right? So because right, we all are what we call citizens of this nation state, right? Uh, we are all imbibed with equal rights as subjects or citizens of the state and that the law created by the state is universally applicable to all of the citizens within that state, right? The law establishing the rights and obligations are not formulated outside the concrete social framework of the state, right? Um, so even if we have specific groups like Muslims who have their own personal laws based on religion, right? These can only be provided and endorsed by the specific state in state laws and institutions. Right? It is not our right to have these laws. These laws can only be practiced and observed by us because the state constitutions make it possible for these laws to, uh, to be applied to us specifically. Right? And the nation state itself right, and all its agencies is bound by the rule of law. Right? No one can do anything he pleases outside the ambit of the law even those who say that they are speaking in the name of divine authority or in the name of Allah and that their law is Sharia, etc., they cannot do as they think or as they like without being subjected to the norms, the legal norms defined in the constitution, right? And by other laws that are legitimately passed by parliament, which is the only sovereign lawmaking authority. Right? So yeah, so even those who claim that they are speaking in the name of God must understand that they are working within this framework of the nation state and that nation state is the only legitimate authority that provides that framework of rights, right? That determines the basis of lawmaking and the administration of justice. Now, talking about change still, right? Of course, like I said, change has affected our, the structure of our society has made our society evolve in very complex ways and very pluralistic uh, arrange, uh, composition as well. But the, the social change have also, in for the purposes of this lecture, uh, the focus of social change is on the family structure, right? So we see that, you know, uh, there have been great or uh, deep and profound changes affecting the family, right? Especially women within the family. Traditional gender roles have of course, very much change, right, with uh, development and with, and with modernization. So you find, you know, people all having access to education. In Singapore, education is compulsory for the first six years. So irrespective of gender, everyone has to be sent to school. And also data-wise, in the case of the Malay Muslim community in Singapore, the girls are, are, are more, there's a higher number of girls right, in tertiary institutions, that means the polytechnics and the university, compared to the males, right? we are seeing this trend. So of course, with mass education as a result of change and, uh, and educational opportunities for both gender, we find that many, many more women are going to school, getting, uh, achieving very uh, highly in their respective disciplines, and also then right, uh, partaking uh, actively in the workforce and many of them or some of them are doing very well right uh, in leadership positions in jobs etc and they also partake in civic uh, organizations in leadership positions and this is what is happening not just to the muslims but more so in the case of the non-muslims and this is going on right so we have the law right as a result of all these changes are also having to respond to these changes so essentially, uh, you have, for example, you know, all the laws, right, including the Muslim law, are not very isolated from these changes. Um, you have changing norms as well, or, and conventions to do with marriage. The very idea of marriage is also changing. Marriage is taking place at a later period. Uh, people are marrying not because they want to be protected or maintain uh, 
uh, by the husbands, like how you know our grandparents had to undergo this. Uh, many women in the past married because they have no choice and that they needed to be supported by their husbands, etc. But this has uh, is seeing a, a big change because women are get, becoming economically independent, right? And can be, and can need not be uh, subjected to the same conventions as in the past. Yeah, so we have since the 1960s, right, a lot of these changes taking place in Singapore. The Women's Charter that is meant for non-Muslims in Singapore, which was introduced in 1961, had already during that time banned polygamy, right, amongst other things, and made uh, you know, laws on marriage and divorce equally applicable to both, right? There's no distinction in the substance of the law between, between men and women, husbands and wives, who want to obtain, for example, divorce or who are, you know, or on other ancillary uh, matters, right? So this has been happening for some time. And Muslim law has also uh, responded to these changes in some ways because the non-Muslim law, the Women's Charter, has uh, evolved you know, and Muslim law also mirrors some of these changes that have been taking place in the case of the non-Muslims. Um, yeah, so, so all these things are happening, right? And what is happening is that uh, there are, of course, not all the time, right, that easy adaptation to all these changes, uh, even outside or beyond the sphere of the law there are resistance to changes, right? Cultural resistance to changes, et cetera. And these changes, uh, these kinds of responses, scholars have briefly categorized them into maybe three types, right? But of course, there are more. And these are you know, uh, effectively referred to as traditionalism, revivalism and reformism. So in response to change, in response to modernity, we find that there are elements that are very reluctant to adapt, right? And these are groups with a certain mode of thinking about the past, right? They feel that the past gives them the certainty, gives them that security, and that if you depart from the past, then you will, you know, compromise uh, certain things. For example, you might compromise your religion, you might compromise your values, and you might compromise your cultural identity, etc. So traditionalism is one uh, example of a type of orientation that has uh, some challenges with responding to modernity. It's very emotional, this kind of uh, orientation. It's not uh, intellectual. Okay? The other kind that you often see is revivalism. Right? This is what we call, I mean, people refer to it as, scholars refer to it as revivalism, but sometimes it's the term may also not be quite accurate because uh, for example, culture and religion, for example, has never been dead, right? So there's no need to revive it. It's more like a reinvention, right? They, are, they want the change, but they don't want to give up their tradition. So they, they, they are quite different from the traditionalists to some extent, because they also, traditionalists just take everything from the past as they are. But these so-called revivalists, they go back to the past in the face of change, but they, in, the, in doing so, they reinvent the past, right? They don't take it as uh, uh, literally. They try to reinterpret it, right, uh, to suit the present. But they, they, in so doing, of course, they are imagining the, 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 the past. And this imagination is not uh, a constructive one, right? And this, these two right, are quite different from another mode of response to change and what we, what we call reformism is quite different from the other two. These are really, you know, if in fact, these are a very small group of people with that kind of orientation because they are, they have the capacity to think, they have the capacity to understand, right? What aspects of the past needs to be uh, uh, safeguarded and developed and what aspects of the present uh, can, can be useful and they also involve themselves, devote their, their minds and their struggles to trying to synthesize these creatively so that the society can move on in a constructive way. So all these that are happening are general. I, I, I mean, it's not just in the domain of the law, but we see these uh, elements of, of you know, 
attempting to adapt uh, and some more success, successfully than others. So in the domain of the law, right, this is also very much happening. So before we talk about the impact of uh, Muslim law in Singapore, maybe we need to give you a brief history of the laws very, very briefly. Something like in the case of Indonesia, right? Uh, Singapore Muslims were subjected to, uh, you know, pre-colonial laws, which is essentially adat, a mixture of adat and Islamic law, right? And this adat and Islamic law have been compiled in the form of legal digest before the colonial period. So, for example, adat Minangkabau, they have their own Minangkabau laws that have been compiled by the thinkers of our of our community long before the coming of the colonials, right? So we did not, what, what the evidence seemed to show that we do, did not have a Puritan Muslim law, Islamic law, whatever, before the coming of uh, the colonials. What we have, it seems to be a combination of various traditions. We have Islamic law. We also have Islamic law adapting to the local customs where these customary laws are not inconsistent with the values of the Islamic law. So uh, it's also very varied because Islamic law come from very many regions, right? From India, from the Middle East and all the rest of the sources. So, and also the different schools of uh, carriers of the religion who brought their versions of Islamic law to this part of the world. So you have Shia influences in our laws, you have Sunni traditions, even though we are said to be following the Shafi'i Mashab to a large extent. So it was a combination of even feudal laws, you know, the laws that are very un-Islamic. Right? For example, the king can do no wrong. Right? The king is above the law. These are all very Islamic uh, legal tradition. But it's part of the Undang-Undang Melaka, for example, which is copied by other states, the Undang-Undang Johor and things like that. They follow these laws. So there is not a Puritan Muslim law in the past. It's a combination of many different laws, right? some even an Islamic elements, although Islam has come to the region for many centuries. Because again here, using the sociology of law approach, you'll find that it is why this, this certain un-Islamic uh, laws become entrenched has a lot to do also with the agencies who make these laws, who want to protect their interests right? using these laws. So feudal custom that, you know, uh, give the king uh, rights which are unknown in Islamic law is, is, is there because it is the kings who decide right, what the law should be and should not be. So we shouldn't be naive to think like some people today that the coming of Islam uh, reform all the existing laws and, and introduce right, uh, Muslim or Islamic law or Sharia and that the colonials when they came you know, departed from it and and just uh, abandon Islamic law. Things were not as simple as that, right? Prior to the coming of Islam, there's a mixture of many laws, some of which are not even very Islamic, right? Because of group interest and ideology. So when, when the colonials came, they, one thing about them, they respected the family law, right? Because they did not want to create unnecessary backlash for themselves. So from the very beginning, in the case of uh, Singapore, in the case of Malaysia, and I'm sure in the case of Indonesia as well, the Dutch and then the British, they acknowledge right, the laws on marriage and divorce uh, amongst Muslims and even other customary laws for other communities here. And they also, to some extent, acknowledge uh, the laws of inheritance. Right? So in all other areas, they introduce the civil law or the common law. In the case of Indonesia, civil law. In the case of uh, Malaya, the common law, right? Based on the English legal tradition. So these are general laws applicable to everyone, but they carve out this particular niche, which is on marriage, divorce, and inheritance, in which they allowed the Muslim law to persist. So these are, they, 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 there did not seem to be any issues with how the Malaysia reacted to these laws. They were quite all right with these laws. Uh, they didn't seem to be any protests. Uh, in fact, you know, like for example, the law to do with inheritance, uh, they, they, although they acknowledged the Muslim law, they created enactments uh, or ordinances which, allowed, which are general. And then within that act, the, the Muslims are allowed to opt for, for the Farai if they choose to. Right? They did not create 
special inheritance laws, but they created general laws. And within these general laws, like the Wills Act, the Muslims can opt for Muslim law of, of inheritance. So this is some of the things that they did. And generally, they, they worked together with the Muslim elites uh, in the country at that time. Right? So these Muslim elites, they are religious elites, they are also um, political elites. Most of them are educated, right? Uh, some are in English educated already at that time. And they uh, form an advisory group, they, the, the British form an advisory group. And these elites advise the British on what should be done in terms of the laws for them. So it is not really a top-down approach, the British imposing these laws on the local Muslim community. In fact, they, they, they developed a system whereby they got the, they appointed these elites and then these elites advised them right, on matters to do with the Muslim law, which is supposed to then affect the Muslim law, Muslims as a whole. So this occurred and continued uh, in the case of Malaysia as well as in Singapore. The first uh, enactment that was passed in Singapore was in 1880, an ordinance called the Muslims Ordinance, which made registration of marriage compulsory. So this is again because of changing conditions. Before that, marriage was not, need not be registered. So later, slowly, they started from 1880 onwards, they started to introduce a series of laws right, to regulate these particular aspects of Muslim life. But most of these laws have nothing to do with the substance of the law. That means they did not legislate positive law. They did not legislate fake. What they did was that they legislated the administration of this substantive law. They did not codify the substantive law because they felt it's not their role maybe because where they come from, right? Religion and, and, and state are separate. So here too, they did not involve themselves in determining what the substantive law is. They only regulated the administration. For example, they said uh, divorces should be registered, uh, marriages should be registered. Then who should be the Qadi? What are the Qadi's powers? What are the Qadi's qualifications, etc.? What will happen if you don't register your marriage? So all these are to do with procedures, administration. They didn't say what is a valid Muslim marriage which has to do with then the substance, right? So that's not included in the ordinances. They left it to the theologians. They left it to the ulama to decide what should be the law to be applied, right? So this system of you know, uh, consulting the custodians, the community elite, uh, was, a, was continued right until independence, right? So in 1957, I think the British passed the, that enactment, a last, one of those last enactments that established the Sharia court. And then after that, we have independence, okay? So during independence, what happened was that there was no division, right? Between, I mean, there's no change. There's no discussion about whether this system, this arrangement whereby you have one law for non-Muslims, for family, women's charter, and another law for Muslims. They did not question whether this arrangement should change or whether this arrangement should persist. They took it as something that worked, right? And, they, and that this, there was no resistance. So they continued this thing. So in 1961, they passed the women's charter for non-Muslims. In 1966, they passed the administration of the Muslim Law Act for Muslims. So these two acts uh, were created by parliament, right? And for AMLA, the Administration of the Muslim Law Act, the Muslims, right, had a, had a, a Muslim elites advise the government. And also many Muslim organizational elites also partook in the making of this act. They gave their, their feedback as to what they think the provisions of the act should or should not uh, encompass, right? So it is again here uh, an act that is not made by the government without uh, Muslim uh, participation. From the very beginning, the government was cautious and took into consideration uh, all these issues uh, that is relevant for, for the making of the Muslim law, okay? So, <clears throat> yeah, so essentially, right, uh, AMLA was a progressive piece of legislation, or at least that's what the, 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 the elites thought about the law. It attempted to reform 
introduced some reform to the Muslim law, right? Uh, for example, it gave more rights to women as far as marriage and divorce was, was concerned. It ensured that you know, they were given a right to have maintenance, to have muta'a and all other issues after a divorce uh, uh, takes place, right? And as, as much as possible, they want to try to strengthen marriages and to create uh, stable families. Because before AMLA was passed, the divorce rate in the Malay community was very, very high. So by making or strengthening the power of the Sharia court, etc., they tried to buttress or to strengthen the marriage uh, institution for the Malays. Right? So they claim it is a very progressive piece of legislation. They also tried to include uh, certain sources of laws from other jurisdictions, like in India, they included the FASA, Charai FASA and all the provisions there to give women ample grounds for divorce. Right? They also uh, allowed for you know, minimum age of marriage to be introduced. And in the first case, it was 16. Uh, age of marriage was 16 in AMLA. And then they also, you know, uh, yeah, they, they tried to uh, use any other, they said that they can use uh, custom as a basis of law. So they give respect to Malay Adat to ensure that the law is, is quite, um, you know, congruent with the experiences of the local people here. They also said that, you know, although they follow Shafi'i school, or although the Shafi'i school is supposed to be the source of authority, but if it results in hardship or if it creates impediments to welfare, then other mazhab's uh, rulings can also be used. So in that sense, the makers of the AMLA, they were very, uh, very interested right, to ensure that the AMLA is a progressive piece of legislation. But many of them stopped short there. The elites did not question whether the Women's Charter, whether it's Islamic or not, because the Women's Charter is a more comprehensive system of laws that is of uh, national uh, status. And whether what, what whether you know uh, the it would make sense for Muslims to also be subjected to the women's charter, there, there was very little discussion about that. Even though one or two voices were heard in Parliament and who wrote about these issues, one of them is actually the late Professor Ahmad Ibrahim, right, who was the rector of uh, University Islam uh, University, International Islamic University Malaysia, but he he has of course, passed away, but he was the first attorney general of Singapore and, and quite ahead of his time, he was one of those who questioned whether we should, Muslims should still remain bound by the Muslim law or whether they should become part of the general law that is the Women's Charter because he in himself believed personally that the Muslim law and its provisions are not as superior to the woman's charter as far as all these rights of the individuals in the family is concerned. He, and he thinks that you know, uh, if you follow the objective of the Muslim law, and if you follow the principles uh, that has been expounded by most of the Muslim jurists, these principles are not incompatible with the national law that is the, the woman's charter for non-Muslims. And he feels that the Muslims has much to gain by being part of that woman's charter. But of course, his voice was uh, a minority view. So in the end, uh, it was not, of course, taken to consideration. So until today, we have two different systems of laws, right? Four family matters, one for Muslims, one for non-Muslims. But despite that, there's a lot, Singapore is unique in this sense compared to Malaysia. In the case of Malaysia, what you are seeing is a kind of you know, uh, exclusion between the two courts, right? Matters falling under the Muslim law will be strictly uh, heard in the Muslim court. Matters falling under the civil law will be strictly heard by the civil courts. And this separation is becoming more and more intense. But in the case of Singapore, even though we have this separation, it is quite a different system here because there's a lot of interaction between the Sharia court and the civil court. And this interaction has allowed the Sharia courts and the law to develop uh, in certain areas, right? which maybe would not have been the case if this arrangement did not exist. So what are these areas of interactions? Very many, right? Almost every important thing. 
So for example, nafka, right? Nafka of wives, nafka of children during a marriage. When a husband could or fail to provide nafka, the court that will hear this case is not the Sharia court, but the family justice court, that's the civil court, right? All Muslims will be, will be sent to that court like the non-Muslims because they see the principles as compatible. Nafka is maintenance, is in the interest of justice for wives and children to be maintained, so therefore the need for this. So the same thing here with uh, this kind of thing. Then over time also, other things get extended. So for example, in 1999, right, there was some amendments that was made to the Muslim law. It allows custody disputes to be heard by the non-Muslim court or the family justice court, as we call it. Okay? So custody of Muslim marriages, Muslim parents ha having disputes over custody of their children, they can bring the matter to the family court, which is for the non-Muslims, if they both agree to have that court hear their case. If one wants the Sharia court to hear, the other one wants the civil court to hear, then the Sharia court must give permission, must give leave. Right? Apart from custody, matrimonial property, harta sepancarian. This one is also now allowed for both courts to hear, even though the case involves Muslim parties. Right? So if, again, if both of them got no objections, they can bring the matter to the civil court. If anyone objects, the Sharia court will have to listen to whether they can do it or not. Right? So they have to give permission. And then also enforcement. Enforcement. So Sharia court can pass the order. So Sharia court can say that the, that, uh, so that the wife will get uh, the property. But how is this order to be enforced? The Sharia court does not enforce these orders. So it is the civil court that will enforce these orders. So the Sharia court creates the order. Then the order will be brought to the civil court if the party did not fulfill that order. And then there's a complaint then the civil court can hear and determine the case. Even inheritance, the Sharia court can declare faraid who gets what, right? The Sharia court has the power to declare that. But if there's a dispute, then the dispute will be heard by the civil court. Similarly, also, if there are to be violence in a family, let's say the husband beat the wife or the wife beats the husband regularly and there's proof that this is the case, and the wife or the husband, they want to, the matter to stop. They bring this matter not to the Sharia court, but to the civil court, even though they are Muslims. And the civil court will grant them the personal protection order against uh, violence in the family. So these are some of the many concurrent areas which we find the two courts actually um, working together side by side. Right? Then also, there have been this case where you have civil court judges right, who, are, who are trained in the civil law. They, can, they have come in to the Sharia court as judges, either on an ad hoc basis or, as a per, or on a permanent basis. And then sometimes also, most of the time, they have already experienced in the civil court before they are admitted into the Sharia court. So this is a change again today, unlike previously. Previously, most of our Sharia court judges, presidents, they are all trained in Al-Azhar or in Malaysian uh, Islamic colleges in the area either of Sharia or on theology. But today we find that there is this change, right? And also the civil court conducts a lot of workshops, training for Sharia court personnel, anything to do with new developments. For example, the, the, the civil court uh, and, uh, rethinking the, the process of dispute settlement in their own family court. They want to emphasize more on mediation. They want to emphasize on arbitration. And they bring the Sharia court personnel for all their training programs, etc., so that the Sharia court is on par with all these developments that's taking place in the civil court. So in the case of Singapore, we have this very good relationship, functional relationship between these two courts, right? And even though... Uh, we are you know, administering the Muslim law, it does not mean that uh, the, the, the civil court has nothing to do with us. 
So also in the case, so these are all some of the progress that has been made in the in since we, we have our since independence. So in the case of the family just Muslim family justice system, just in case many of you may not be familiar, I think ours is sim much, much simpler, of course, compared to the Indonesian system. There are many more complex structure or legal structure within the Indonesian system. For us, uh, as a minority community, right, we have uh, AMLA, the Administration of Muslim Law Act, creates all these uh, institutions within this act. And this act also states what the power and what the jurisdiction of these institutions are. So this AMLA, right, and what, that was passed in 1966, created the Registry of Muslim Marriages. So the non-Muslims have their registry of marriage. The Muslims have their own different registry of Muslim marriage. And this Muslim marriage registry has certain functions that is to register right, marriages that, are, uh, that uh, uh, involve Muslim parties. They also uh, listen to polyg uh, polygamy applications and other things related to marriages. Right? Um, apart from that, you so so the person in, uh, appointed is the kadi, right? So there is a kadi, and there are also other uh, deputy kadis who assist the kadi in this task. Then, of course, we have the Sharia court. The Sharia court, uh, you know, is is uh, is a court that is uh, parked under the uh, a ministry, right? Which is not the same as the Ministry of Law for the non-Muslims. The Sharia court is part under the Ministry of Social and Family Development. Uh, and then also we have the appeal board. This is the highest tribunal in the case of the Muslim fa uh, family law in Singapore. So if they're not happy with the judgments of the Sharia court, they can bring the matter to the appeal board, right? And the appeal board's uh, decision is final. And then we also have fatwa committee, which is uh, uh, sparked in MUIS. So the Majlis Agama Islam Singapura has a fatwa committee. The fatwa committee's role is to create fatwa on issues that have not been determined and which are contemporary. Or when a court of law asks the fatwa committee for a determination on law, the fatwa committee will respond to that uh, request. It can also respond to any query from any member of the community if they want a legal determination on any unprecedented issues. So apart from all this, you also, just now I said, we have the family justice court which is the non-Muslim court, which Muslims also turn to. And we also have superior courts, right? The Family Justice Court has a superior uh, division within it, which also listens to certain disputes, right? Uh, such as those involving property. Um, okay, so wait, let me just see whether... Uh, okay, so what are the key issues on the family justice affecting the Muslims, right? So basically, uh, that although we have all this progress that is taking place uh, in our courts, in our law, we also find that you know, there is uh, some still some lag, L-A-G, right? Uh, still a lack of adjustment here uh, in, in, in meeting the, the demands of change. Just now in the beginning, I explained about how our society is undergoing changes and how our, whether our law is keeping, uh, uh, you know, in keeping in time with these changes, or whether there are some problems here and there. And here, I would like to highlight what are these uh, problems, okay? So basically we have, you know, like I said, uh, changing families uh, structure, uh, changing social structure and its impact on family. And of course, it also affects changing conceptions of marriage. So marriage is no longer uh, seen in the same way, right? Last time, uh, you know, arranged marriages are very common. Uh, parents decided for their children uh, when to marry and who to marry, etc. And the laws are also shaped in that way. But today, of course, it's quite different, right? Uh, we have uh, many Muslim young people have aspirations of marriage based on their own personal choice. They also see marriage as more than just a functional and legal union. Uh, it is, uh, uh, they have romantic ideas about marriage, they have ideas of marriage as a partnership, etc. And they raise their children maybe differently from the ways in which we have raised our, our children. For example, distinction between male and female roles in the household becomes more blurred, right? Because many women go out to work and their children see them as also working women 
not as homemakers only, but also as women who contribute to uh, the, the public domain and things like that. And that shaped the socialization process of the children, uh, irrespective of gender, right? And also, there are also other many different ideas about marriage, right? Age of marriage, people don't want to get married that young, right? And even raising the family, who should raise the family, etc. Increasingly, this function is being taken up by the state because as more women go out to work, the state creates uh, institutions like childcare, right? infant care, all these are uh, uh, support systems to help the family to cope with change, right? So that when they go to work, husbands and wives, somebody is taking care of their children and these are state-initiated efforts. And the state supports all these by giving subsidies for such uh, alternative institutions to provide meaningful uh, and functional role for families today. So despite all these changes, we find that while there are more of these changes taking place with the law for non-Muslims, for Muslims bound by the AMLA, right, while bound by the administration of the Muslim Law Act, uh, we find that these changes, are, uh, although they are taking place, but slower to change, right? Very often, the, the changes made in our law has to do with administration, less to do with the substantive law, right? So like, for example, you know, uh, fake traditions uh, remain because we tend to follow the classical traditions of the past. Uh, there is greater reluctance to adapt or to rethink these changes uh, in the light of the changing social structure and conditions of society. So it took us about, it took Singapore Muslim community more than four decades from 1960 to 2009, I think when our age of marriage was changed from 16 to 18, right? Despite the fact that uh, you know, more and more Muslim women are already married, marry, marrying at later age. So only now, right, in the last few years, has AMLA then you know, changed the age of marriage to 18. There are some issues about consent still, right? Because no matter how uh, uh, well um, educated a girl is, no matter what position she holds in the economic domain in or her work in society, uh, when she gets married or she, when she wants to get married, she still, of course, needs the consent of her guardian or her father most of the time in this case. Uh, and if he disputes or if he refuses consent, then she has to find an alternative, right? And usually, right, the law provides for her to turn to the Qadi. So the Qadi can give the consent on behalf of the father. If, if the father unreasonably withholds consent, he has to make sure that there are no lawful impediments to the consent. So, so basically, a woman cannot marry in her own right. She still needs the consent of either her father or her or, or the Qadi, no matter how, how uh, you know, how different her status is today, right? The old classical tradition still remains intact. And when there are disputes, and these disputes uh, reach the, the courts, right? Uh, for example, it reaches the, the appeal board, the highest uh, tribunal, and these, many of these cases are published. When there are disputes pertaining to these issues, we find that very often the appeal board, which is the highest court, often decide in favor of the girl's choice of her husband, overriding the, the decision of the father or even the Qadi at times, right? Sometimes the Qadi also objects to her marriage in addition to her father. But when it comes to the appeal board, we find that most of the decisions seem to be in her favor. That means the appeal board decide that there's no ground for objecting to this marriage. So most of these cases, right, in the last few years shows you that, you know, at the highest level of the legal process, girls often get the approval from the court to marry a person of their choice, despite objections by their fathers or their guardians. But although now the law has become therefore more or less a formality, this law based on the classical tradition remains intact. Right? Then also, of course, there are polygamous marriages. Um, polygamous marriages like in most other Muslim countries, Singapore does not ban it, right? but it promotes a very restrictive uh, interpretation of conditions satisfying polygamous marriages. So our polygamous marriages, because of the strictness of enforcement of the law, is very limited, very low. But many Muslim males still 
I mean, they, they marry elsewhere, but they cannot register their marriages in Singapore because in Singapore, we, the enforcement of that polygamous marriage is very, very rigid, uh, very strict. Uh, okay? so, so as a result, this is the case. So in, although, therefore, it is not really a problem of magnitude, right? despite the fact that there are men who go away and marry, although the problem as in Singapore is <clears throat> by the data in Singapore is not that high, but again here, women cannot exit from a polygamous marriage easily. That means she cannot get a divorce because her husband is polygamous. She must prove something else, right? For example, she must show that the husband has not treated her equally with the other wives. So that the burden of proof is on her. She must show that this polygamous marriage is not doing her good as compared to the other wives. Right? So, so she has to prove these things. And there are no, no the, the option for exit from a polygamous marriage is not easy for a Muslim woman in Singapore. Although in the end, of course, she will get her divorce, but the process is more onerous and not so uh, easy, right? Now, of course, there's also another major area here that is to do with women's rights to divorce. So as you know, in Singapore, maybe you, you might not know, but in Singapore, talak for males is, can be done without cause, right? No, men, of course, can just uh, utter the talak and without having to show any ground for divorce. And that, you know, as long as this pronouncement is clear, the court will validate it. And even if it's pronounced outside court, it can still be validated uh, when the court asks him in court, right, what exactly did he say? So if he express his talak clearly, that will operate as an effective talak. Right? On the other hand, women are different. They have to prove a ground for divorce. That means they have to show why they want to divorce. So we have the same types of divorce open to women. Cherai holo, right? this is uh, tebos talak, we call it in Malay in which the woman has the right to divorce and usually she has to give back the marriage gift or, or hantaran to the husband. But the process becomes cumbersome when the husband refuses to divorce her. So if that is the case, even though she has the right to tebos talak, right, if the husband refuses to divorce her, then she has to go through another process, both she and the husband, which is that they have to have hakam appointed by the court to listen and to try to reconcile them and, to, and if the husband still refuse, the hakam can have the right, if the husband consents, to pronounce the divorce on his behalf. So the process is, is very complicated and, as, and, and it can extend the, the, the length of the divorce process. And then you have cherai taklik, right? Cherai taklik is conditional divorce. There are four major grounds upon which a woman can seek divorce. Of course, the taklik is not only confined to these four, but these are the four that are printed on our marriage certificates. And most women do not add on anymore because these are like standard printed conditions on the marriage certificate. Most women also don't know about their rights to add more if they want to, including maybe objections to polygamy, poly, poly, polygamy and things like that. So basically the foregrounds. Or she can get a divorce by FASA. And here, even though the, the AMLA in section 49, has listed nine grounds uh, for FASA divorce, we find that the court is very reluctant to apply or to allow for divorce by FASA. So FASA is another, you know, although it seems to be a good thing based on the letter of the law, but it has never been used. It has only been used for the cases of chronic illness, when a person, when the husband suffers from incurable illness, or is mad, insane, or if uh, you know uh, he's impotent. So these are only the three only cases. Even though the grounds for FASA is very wide, the court is reluctant to allow women to use FASA as an option for divorce. Right? So yeah. So as a result, you see that there is this unequal rights of women to divorce. Again, this is based on the classical tradition, right? The classical school which uh, continues to pervade uh, the administration and the selection of the law in Singapore. And then also, for example, um, you know, the idea of loyalty of women as an obligation, uh, ta'at kepada suami, this is a legal obligation, right? Uh, expected of women. 
and of not not both huh? it's just one because the man maintain the woman the understanding is that because by law the man maintains the woman therefore the woman uh, is expected to show loyalty to the husband and that if she is guilty of no shoes or recalcitrance then of course that will affect her her rights uh, to her rights to claims of maintenance uh, and muta'a right uh, yeah so uh, about this compensation about Ada and muta'a here i think it's important to also understand that even here right it, uh, nafka Ada is also still confined to 3 months uh, and in despite the fact that also you know women uh, actually also contribute to the the home especially if they are working they contribute to the home the law remains that they are not obliged to contribute right so financial contributions maintenance is the law admits is still right very much a men's affair uh, by law women need not contribute if she don't and she keeps all the money to herself is still fine right but if she does it it is all right too okay so it's not an obligation despite the fact that in actuality based on the standard of living and also changing notions of marriage women all contribute to the matrimonial home and then for nafka eda right and it, uh, it is still confined to three months whether or not they are working or as a homemaker without rethinking all these things in context and needs right and muta'a also is based on a certain uh, proportion that seems to have been standardized uh, over time and then the division of matrimonial property here there are some improvements right not so traditional so at one time right it, uh, women did not get anything at all when they were faced with divorce in the sharia court it was only in the 1980s when the sharia court started to give uh, uh, some property to women when they divorce right and then in the case of custody of children also they follow the classical school even though right, the principle of the paramount interest of the child is uh, supreme. So in the case of inheritance, there are very pressing issues here, uh, just like in the case of divorce and, and marriage. There's also some pressing issues in the case of inheritance because right, the AMLA binds all Muslims to the Muslim law when it, it concerns matters of inheritance. So the Muslim law here is very uh, literal, right? Uh, there is no rethinking or debates on this law. Yeah, so we, girls get half what, uh, daughters get half what sons uh, will get and all the rest of the proportion. If there are no daughters, then you know uncles will get a share and also Baitul Mal will get a share of, of the inheritance and things like that. So we follow the strict uh, classical uh, interpretation of the Faraid. And as a result, and, Mus and Muslims also can only will away one third of their inheritance under the Shafi'i school. And this willing away cannot be to the beneficiaries, right? to the waris. It can only be to others. And the two thirds must be decided on the basis of the faraid. So there are attempts right, on the part of uh, the court uh, and Muis to mitigate this, right? So when, when there are problems that, uh, that come before Muiz uh, for consideration about the problems of this literal interpretation, Muiz will always try to resolve this matter outside the, the law, right? They will appeal to the ethical conscience of the party. So for example, in the case of Muslim, non-Muslim marriage, right? The fatwa in Singapore is that a non-Muslim cannot claim the property of a Muslim Muslim cannot claim the property of a non-Muslim. So when there is a marriage and one person dies, the Muslim dies, his inheritance has to be decided by the Muslim law. Now, that, based on the fatwa, the non-Muslim wife and children cannot claim anything. But because they have a problem, they cannot survive maybe, right? They have, they have issues to do with uh, maintaining the children, etc. So they need that inheritance from the Muslim spouse who have passed away. They normally bring the matter to Muiz. Muiz will listen to the case, and then Muiz will say, Muiz will call all the waris, the Muslims uh, belonging to the husband side, and will appeal to the waris to uh, have the property given to the non-Muslim wife and children, right? But Muiz mm. will never change its fatwa. The fatwa will remain the same. Excuse me, Prof. Uh, five more minutes. Okay. Okay. So basically, we have these kinds of issues to do with joint tenancy, 
also, right, in the case of maybe later, if you want to ask questions about this, I will explain what the problems are with regards to inheritance and the Faraid. There's a, a lot of problems there. Then we have these issues about revivalism today, right? So apart from these problems of the adhering to the classical tradition, uh, without rethinking about the, the needs of the changing tradition of society, we have also the rise of this uh, resurgence of Islam. And we see uh, that this resurgence of Islam is also impacting on Muslim law, right? But they are not interested in the problems of the Muslim law that we have been talking about. Their interest is more in promoting a discourse that has nothing much to do with the law in operation, the concrete laws and its problems in operation. Their discussion is more about uh, promoting an alternative legal system based on their understanding of Islam as ad din And this alternative legal system, they believe is fixed, right? God has fixed this system. And our role as Muslims is merely to implement this system. So they are assertive, this group, they are assertive in the public sphere. They propagate these views in their writings. They are made up essentially of theologians. And we can see that basically they are against uh, attempt to create this good relationship between the Sharia court and the, and the civil court, right? They, are, they feel that the civil court is secular, that the laws propounded in the civil court are un-Islamic, and that even to do with the, you know, the sharing of these matters to do with Muslim law in the civil court, they believe that this is, should not be the way because the Sharia court is meant for Muslims, the civil court is meant for non-Muslims, going to the civil court is un-Islamic. They were also against the appointment of civil court judges, civil law judges into the Sharia court because they think that these are people who are not trained in the Sharia and therefore will undermine the, the integrity of the Sharia court and the power of the Sharia court. So they are for exclusive, exclusive domain of the Muslim law. And they also want an expansion of the, of the criminal powers that the Sharia court should have uh, as listed in our AMLA, right? So for example, AMLA talks about ajaran sesat and imposes punishment for ajaran sesat. They say that this, this should be given effect to. They, in recent times, you know, with the, with the demonizing of Shia, etc., we also see that, you know, in, that uh, there has been some elements that denounces marriage between Sunnis and the Shias as un-Islamic, etc. And they use this uh, fake minority to exempt the Muslims from the Sharia law. So they say that actually we have these fixed laws in which hudud is compulsory and in which we should implement. But because we are a minority, we cannot, uh, God will forgive us because we cannot implement these laws. And therefore, to justify that, they use the minority fig promoted by uh, uh, scholars like Kardawi, uh, who says that, you know, uh, if you are in a minority, in a non-Muslim majority state, then certain things are not obligate, obligatory on you. Of course, we all know all that, but to them, right, the difference here is that they still believe that should they have power, they will implement this mandatory Muslim law, which they believe to be divine. And okay, so basically, right, there are issues here. You see that there are all these problems and, you know, lack of adjustment here. So what happens here is that, why my, my main argument here is that the Muslim law is binding on all Muslims. That means if you're born Muslim or if you embrace Islam, you are bound by this law, right? So law and religious belief are not separated. If you believe in Islam, you must be bound by the law as, uh, as implemented. Uh, by the courts and by AMLA, right, or, or stipulated in AMLA, you have no choice, even if you don't agree with the interpretation of that law. And that if you believe that the Muslim tra legal tradition is very diverse, and that you believe that the law that is implemented is not what the law should be, and that there are other uh, readings to and traditions in our legal system which must be revived, you, you, no one will listen to you, right, because you are not open to all these things. You are bound by the law. So because you are bound by the Muslim law, you have no right to access the general law, even if you believe that that general law, like the Wills Act and aspects of the Women's Charter, are relevant to you as a Muslim, are better to you as a Muslim, right? Even if you feel that there's nothing un-Islamic about those laws, those laws are still binding on you. So you don't have the right of choice as a citizen, right? The state decides what the law bind, that binds you should be, 
And this is the Muslim law as defined by the theologians and the religious elites. And therefore, you know, you can't do anything very much, right? So as far as the, the situation here is concerned, therefore, uh, a lot on the prospect of the, all these problems, can these problems that we've been talking about be changed? A lot of these depends very much on the, the type of Muslim elite that we have and how open they are to rethinking the law, how open they are to, to rethinking the principles and of, the, of the Muslim law and to develop it using not just the, our tradition of the past, but also good, good ideas stemming from other legal traditions, including the national laws, right? which is they claim already to be secular and non-Muslims. And that when, when they do these kinds of changes or reform, that these should be congruent with what's taking place at the, in the other realm of the non-Muslim family law, because Muslims are not isolated from that non-Muslim family law. They live side by side with others, they know what are the benefits there that's offered by the non-Muslim law, and they know the limitations of their own laws, and, they, and any changes should be also be taken from, or at least you know, used as a kind of a mirror of the progress of our laws. And of course, you know, it also involves reform in religious education, and it needs also to uh, in, in, the, the Sharia court to be able, and our laws to be able to reform it requires, of course, uh, professionalism of our judicial officers. They should be well trained, etc. And also, right, uh, we have to be very careful with the with the rise of these revivalist demands for uh, an exclusive Sharia law. Uh, the state must make sure that law and religion, uh, I mean, law and politics, religion and politics, uh, in the form of the demand for Sharia law, must be effectively managed. Right, otherwise. We will see what is happening in other countries, whereby this conflation between religion and politics are being manifested in the domain of the law, right? And this is causing a lot of problems to rights of individuals and, and intra-community conflicts. So basically, what, what I want to re-emphasize here and as a conclusion is that I think in order to think through these problems, one has to think about whether religious faith and law ought to be conflated or whether law and religious faith can or should be separated. And I think this is important as the society becomes more complex because of different and divergent interpretations of the law. And it becomes even more complex and more dangerous if the people who are in power and who are responsible for Muslim lawmaking or Islamic lawmaking are of the revivalist type. Right? And then they want to expand this fear of the Muslim law to include other matters, right, which people of that religious faith may not agree with. Just now, uh, uh, Prof. Pradhana talked about this problem, about the situation also in Indonesia, where there's a, there is a, an assertion for the expansion of the Sharia, right? And this is this this is a dangerous uh, to me. Can is dangerous potentially because it can have implications on the individual right to think of his faith and law in a different way. So there is a need therefore to rethink this potential separation of the two. If you integrate them both as one, you conflate them both as one, it can lead to a lot of problems. Okay? Uh, also, although the state provides for Muslim family law, it should not infringe the rights of Muslims as citizens. That means the state should not uh, exclude the Muslims unnecessarily from the national law. And also that you know, Muslims should be given the right of choice of law as citizens, and that the choice of law, even if they choose to go and have their matters settled in the non-Muslim court using the non-Muslim law, if they feel that that's compatible with their faith, this will not undermine the Muslim law because you are not doing anything to that Muslim law. The Muslim law is intact. It's just that people may choose to have that option and that in that doing so, maybe that will be a catalyst for the Sharia court and the Sharia law to reform, to start thinking about all these changes that is taking place around them. This is not to say that they have not, but there are still uh, areas of maladjustment and lag in, in terms of development. And in making this, this uh, reforming the law for Muslims, right? In the Sharia law should therefore take into consideration that the whole process of democratization is a force that cannot be turned back. Society is becoming more conscious of their rights, more conscious of their 
role in, in decision making, etc. And therefore, uh, any lawmaking process involving Muslims must conform to that democratic process. And that uh, the, the, the law cannot be utopian, the law cannot be something out of the ordinary of our social norms. It must be based on our social norms. It cannot be something that is re that attempts to revive 10th century practices as if these are legitimate for us today. And also that we need to develop legal thought if we want uh, reforms in the Muslim law. And legal thought here doesn't mean a particular substantive fit. It's about principles, developing principles in relation to new kinds of problems and also professionalizing our system, right? That means from the judicial officers, giving them the record the, 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 that is due, giving them the, the educational, good educational background um, qualifications and training that is, that is due to them to improve the system, recognizing their salaries, recognizing their career trajectories, et cetera, and having good, uh, you know, yeah, judgments, et cetera, coming from them, which are properly documented so that this can contribute to scholarship and thinking about Muslim law. So I think, uh, Dr. Pradhana, with these, I think that uh, I have completed these questions, uh, this, this, uh, this talk, yeah. So I welcome any uh, questions or issues or clarifications. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Faisal, for very comprehensive uh, presentation and I'm sure that uh, all of you uh, have many questions regarding all issues that has been presented but before you know, we have another presentation by Professor Master Hilmi so I will give opportunity to Prof. Master Hilmi to present about uh, 30 minutes Prof. Master time is yours Thank you very much, uh, Mas Pradana Boy. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam. Dear uh, Professor Nur Aisyah, uh, dear Pradana Boy, and uh, professors, all professors of uh, UMM, uh, lecturers, <coughs> and uh, distinguished participants. It is a great pleasure for me, of course, to compliment, to, to make a complimentary uh, feedback or comments to uh, Professor uh, Isaac's presentation this morning. Uh, of course, uh, as a feedback, I uh, I have some difficulties to to identify which point should I give uh, more emphasis. Um, nevertheless, I am trying my best to to make a, a, a proportional comments as best as, uh, as, as I can. Um, of course, I appreciate what. Uh, Professor Nur Aisha has presented so far regarding the applications of uh, Muslim personal law in Singapore and Malaysia. Uh, it might be there might be some differences between uh, those two countries and Indonesia. Uh, I think we need more investigations and uh, serious uh, in-depth research regarding the applications of uh, Muslim personal law in, in Indonesia. Even though, of course, there are uh, some more similarities between Muslim personal law in this country and uh, the same law in Malaysia and, and Singapore. But basically, uh, what we have known so far uh, about the application of Islamic law coming out, coming out from our understanding and knowledge about uh, Sharia or Islamic law in general from um, Islamic schools like madrasas or pesantrens. 
uh, which which of course uh, will drive uh, our understanding uh, on uh, some contemporary issues in Islamic law in this country. Well, uh, if we are talking about the uh, application or, or implementation of Islamic law in this country, of course, we cannot separate our understanding of uh, um, Islamic law in classical context. Um, so far, Indonesia is one of the Muslim majority countries that is affected uh, uh, heavily by the a Sabi school of thought. Um, even though we have known that uh, it is only one uh, major school of thought in among uh, Sunni uh, Sunni school of thoughts, in addition to um, Shafi'i school of thought, Maliki school of thought, and uh, Hambali school of thought. So, what is uh, popular now in Indonesia is uh, only one um, school of thought that is uh, a Shafi'i school of thought. Nevertheless, we uh, are sometimes um, uh, uh, struck in a heavy debate or in a, um, in, in a fierce uh, dynamics of discussion uh, between uh, one uh, scholar to another, especially with regard to the Muslim uh, family laws um, uh, regulated by, by the state. Um, if we are trying to trace the epistemological roots of those uh, thoughts between uh, Shafi'i uh, Hambali, uh, Maliki, and uh, Hanafi school of thoughts, of course, uh, why we, we might ask why those schools of thought exist in the history of uh, Islamic law um, in Islam. I think at least we can identify two major, two major causes why those schools of thought existed. The first one is uh, um, regarding the, the role of reason in understanding the revelation or in understanding religion. Um, as we have known that um, one school of thought is the thesis uh, of other schools of thought. Um, the, the oldest school of thought is uh, Hanafi, Hanafi school of thought, which emphasizes more on the role of uh, reason. And this school of thought is then uh, was responded by uh, Maliki school of thought, which uh, emphasizes uh, more on the role of tradition, Muslim tradition. Then the, we, we can find, for example, the, the products of Safi, of uh, Hanbali, oh no, sorry, of uh, Hanafi school of thought is mo much more rational compared to the uh, Maliki school of thought, which uh, accommodates more on the role of uh, Muslim tradition in, in Medina or in, in Mecca. And then uh, there comes uh, the third uh, school of thought that is Shafi school of thought, which um, tried to accommodate the two. Uh, try to stand in between the two in response to the uh, the uh, moderation uh, the in role between uh, reason um, and reason and the revelation so we, we can say that uh, Shafi school of thought uh, tries to to be a moderate uh, stream uh, among the two. But then there comes the fourth uh, school of thought that is Hanbali, which uh, ironically uh, uh, becomes the, the vinyl antithesis of the previous uh, three schools of thought, uh, 
which puts a uh, heavy emphasis on the role of uh, tax or regulation. So the products of uh, uh, Hanbali schools of thought is uh, much more uh, literal than or compared to the products of the uh, three pre previous uh, uh, schools of thought. Um, why I I should am uh, I sh I should um, uh, bring uh, the issue of the importance of reason into uh, this uh, these talks is be because um, the same uh, the same case happens uh, today in many parts of the Muslim world, uh, including in Indonesia. Uh, the the second cause why there are uh, dynamics and uh, differences in uh, Muslim legal Muslim legal thoughts is uh, regarding the positions the position of human uh, in the in the uh, uh, in the center of, of matters uh, some. Uh, seems to position humans not in the center of matters or, or, or issue. Uh, and the uh, other schools of thought uh, position uh, more on uh, the God uh, instead of human. So we can say, for example, uh, almost all classical schools of thought uh, uh, tries to position uh, uh, human in uh, less important, uh, less less important uh, position compared to the position of God. So the characteristics of uh, classical Muslim uh, legal thought is, uh, you know, tends to be more theocentric rather than anthropocentric. But uh, there, there was a juncture, there was a, a starting point where uh, the position of uh, human is uh, emphasized more. That is during the, uh, during the 14th century through uh, one of the uh, Andalusian uh, ulama, that is Ashadibi, uh, where uh, he tries to formulate the so-called uh, maslaha. The concept of, of maslaha was introduced firstly by uh, Ashadibi through uh, his work Al Muwafaqat uh, in the tradition of uh, Muslim jurisprudence, and uh, this sparks the idea of maslaha introduced by Ashadibi then sparks the, the debate and discussion among Muslim jurists throughout centuries. Uh, and one of the, um, one, one of the contemporary Muslim jurists who respond seriously about the issue of Maslaha and develop further is uh, uh, Ibn Ashur, Muhammad Tawheed bin Ibn Ashur, who lived or who, dead, uh, who, who died uh, in 1973. But then uh, the, the debate of the position of human uh, in the center of Islamic law uh, now, I think, uh, develops, uh, develops uh, further. And we can find a lot of Muslim scholars who tries to uh, put the position of uh, human in an important or significant position and in modern times there are many more Muslim jurists or scholars who push for the, the position of human into the center of issue such as Fazlur Rahman uh, who is educated in in the West also we can find uh, for example Abdullah Ahmed An-Naim and there are some more 
uh, important uh, Muslim scholars who, who tries to understand or put the position of human in a very important uh, uh, position in the issue of Islamic law. So uh, the question is, what can we uh, infer? What can we uh, conclude from the uh, long discussion or long history of Islamic law? That is the, the struggle or the, uh, the, the battle of two paradigms in understanding uh, uh, the law. The first one is uh, the so-called uh, inductive paradigm, uh, which tries to uh, understand law as not as a given or not uh, as a taken for granted from, from God or from revelation, but is a human evolution, evolutionary product. And uh, it is, of course, uh, it is legal for Muslims to um, reformulate or to reinterpret the products of uh, Islamic law. Uh, because uh, law is perceived or is understood as something evolutionary, not as uh, taken for granted or not as a, as a given, uh, which, uh, which uh, what we can say, chumut uh, in, in Islamic uh, terms. And the second one is, of course, deductive paradigm. The deductive paradigm still tries to, to um, put the Islamic law into effect in the literal sense. Uh, it is us human who must uh, adapt to the uh, jurisdiction of Islamic law rather than um, uh, rather than the Islamic law must adapt to, uh, uh, it is us human who must adapt to uh, the jurisdictions of Islamic law, uh, rather, rather than vice versa. Uh, so um, in short, this is about the battle of two paradigms in Islamic law. And I think it applies when we analyze this, when we analyze the, the uh, some uh, so many cases in in contemporary debates, uh, especially in Indonesia, and uh, we can we can uh, mention some characteristics of of uh, uh, inductive uh, paradigm in Islamic law. At least, uh, uh, as far as I am concerned, there are five uh, major characteristics of inductive. Uh, uh, paradigm in Islamic law. The first one is uh, the law is formulated based on empirical needs to make a betterment of society. So, or maslahatul ama. So rather than rather than uh, it is based on the text. The formulation of Islamic law is based on empirical needs, empirical changes. So Muslims um, uh, take into account all uh, social changes and needs into the formulation or the, or the products of Islamic law. This is the first characteristic. And the second one is humans are positioned at the center of uh, issue instead of God. It means that the, the tendency of uh, inductive paradigm in uh, Islamic law is uh, more uh, anthropocentric rather than uh, theocentric. Uh, unlike the most, uh, most of the products of Islamic law in a classical uh, age, for example, where a lot of uh, the products of Islamic law tend to be theocentric, then the, uh, the the inductive paradigm in Islamic law tends to position humans uh, in, in um, a much more important position. This is the second uh, characteristic. And the third one is uh, the substance or the uh, what is behind the text is much more important rather than what is explicitly stated in the text. 
meaning that uh, the inductive paradigm tries to uh, what we call it uh, take into account uh, like asbabun nuzul and asbabul wurud of uh, uh, situational cases or the background sociopolitical backgrounds of what uh, has happened as a, a major consideration rather than just uh, taking uh, the uh, explicit uh, text uh, stated explicitly in the, in the, in the, in the Quran or in, in hadith for example and the four the, the fourth is the incorporation of modern sciences into uh, the process of ijtihad or the process of legal reasoning uh, of course the the development of uh, science uh, and knowledge uh, affected the, the, the way the contemporary or inductive approach uh, perceive uh, uh, the Islamic law. And uh, most of the proponents of inductive paradigms or inductive approach uh, appreciate uh, uh, modern science, either social science or uh, applied sciences uh, as uh, as auxiliary auxiliary means in understanding and 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 in, in producing in producing the uh, the products of law and last but not the least the fifth is the issue of thawabit and mutaghayirat uh, uh, also uh, affects the way the uh, inductive paradigms um plays its role for example uh, they uh, try to understand that that uh, the values universal values such as justice human rights uh, equality before the law are as the permanent values which are uh, not uh, which cannot be changed uh, throughout time and place while uh, the uh, the literal product of islamic law can uh, can can change so as long as as long as the universal values are there then uh, it persists the product is still can be is still can be can be maintained as the uh, you know as the uh, regulation of uh, our family law um i think uh, i'll try to uh, connect this uh, discussion with the case in indonesia where there are a lot of uh, muslim uh, family laws uh, are, are debated by uh, by some scholars and uh, uh, ulama for example the case of polygamy and the case of uh, marriageable age for girls and for boys, the case of uh, in inheritance and, and, and law uh, are among the uh, among the points or the, is the key issues uh, that uh, Muslims in Indonesia uh, uh, tries to understand the Muslim family law in, in the context of uh, our lives. Uh, for example, in the case of marriageable law, uh, it seems to me that uh, there is a still resistance uh, between, uh, among the uh, traditional uh, Muslim Jewish in Indonesia, um, in the sense that they try to they try to uh, still use the product of uh, classical legal thought uh, by arguing that uh, the the limit or the marriageable age is of course uh, as as has been taught by the tradition muslim traditions like uh, what can be found in hadith so of course we uh, cannot make a limitation to uh, marriageable age for girls for example only for uh, only at for example as as can be can be found in the undang-undang Undang-undang uh, perkawinan, where marriageable age is 19, uh, 
uh, for girls and boys. So, if if uh, for example, if there are some cases where uh, boys are recommended to marry a girl, for example, then uh, in, instead of be committing uh, what uh, adultery, for example, then it is uh, recommended for for them to uh, to get married in. Uh, uh, even though even though the the age is still um, not qualified to the uh, uh, according to the regulation or according to undang undang um, in conclusion i think uh, the, we still find inspiration uh, of muslim law from whatever the common law or civil law in Indonesia, maybe civil law is uh, much more relevant to to say in Indonesia, uh, meaning that uh, uh, it is it is still difficult for for Muslims to uh, put into effect the uh, product of more inductive uh, uh, Islamic law in Indonesia because uh, we still use the uh, the secular or the separation the separation between secular law and and islamic law uh, in in the society and uh, it is of course uh, quite difficult for the for the state if we try to introduce a new product of uh, islamic law which uh, which are more relevant to the 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 need of uh, social change, for example, because uh, we still maintain the classical uh, Muslim uh, jurist in our mind, and instead we have to we have to ask the religious elites for uh, for the assistance in explaining why uh, social change or why uh, change uh, must be made. In regulation uh, regarding particular uh, Muslim uh, issues, for example, I think that's all, Mas uh, uh, Pradana. Uh, I am sorry, I cannot, I cannot uh, uh, make uh, my presentation uh, more specific to the need of uh, or in response to uh, Professor Nur Aisha's presentation just now. Uh, I think uh, my comment is just a uh, just a uh, uh, common yeah common feedback uh, mm. from uh, non specialists like me, and it is a great honor for me to to meet uh, uh, Professor uh, Nur Aisha in this uh, opportunity. I hope we we can uh, meet in other uh, opportunities. I think sure. thank you very much, okay. and uh, Prana Poy, thank you. I sorry I cannot. Uh, join further in uh, this uh, lecture. I hope everyone um, is uh, healthy. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Thank you for your feedback. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, Pradana, can I respond to Prof. Master? I can't hear you, Pradana. Pradana, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Maybe, maybe the, the problem of... Uh... What, Prof. Mazda, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear okay. you. Okay. I think Pradana, I cannot hear him. Yes, I think the problem is uh, in his... Uh... Hello, Tess. Ah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay, we can hear you. Yeah, thank very much to Prof. Master for uh, feedback and uh, the the perspective that he offer, and it is important for us to have very. Uh, although although we don't have enough time, but I think Professor Master has offered us some important perspective to understand. The topic of our discussion today. Uh, before Professor Raisa 
uh, all respond to mm -hmm. Professor Master. Uh, I would like to invite maybe some participant are going to raise any question, but let's limit our question to very sim uh, brief, yeah, brief, very brief, and or you can just uh, write down your question. Uh, both in English or in Bahasa Indonesia. And while you are writing your questions, I will give opportunity to Professor to respond to Professor Master's uh, feedback. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Pradana. Also very much thanks to uh, Prof. Master for the very, very, I think, very, very relevant and interesting points that he have raised. I think... Um, yeah, he he amongst the one of the things that you know, uh, the amongst the important points that he has raised is that I think mainly the principles, right? That the major characteristics that he feels ought to be given uh, important and due consideration and attention in our attempt to um, relook at re-examine the Muslim law and re-evaluate the Muslim law, right? Actually, I'm very thankful to Prof Master because. I actually have stated the same points here in a different way, but which I did not manage to present during the, the presentation. And I treated these, the absence of these uh, characteristics as actually the orientation of traditionalism. So for example, when Prof Mazda said that, you know, that law must be formulate, formulated based on empirical needs rather than text, for example, right? And that the position of the human must be at the center of, you know, of the law, right? Because they are the ones who are impacted by this law, by, by the laws. And then that the substance is more important than the text. And that how the laws, uh, the making of the law should incorporate modern science perspectives and technology and legal reasoning, etc. And that the, the importance of understanding what are essential to laws and what are the product of permanence, uh, what are the products of change, or which can be changed, which are historically conditioned. Actually, all these major characteristics, I think, are very important in rethinking the Muslim law. And actually, I have, I have actually uh, also addressed these in my writing. There's now that article that I, I spoke about. And actually, I've used it as characteristics of traditionalism. Right? It is traditionalism that fails to have these major points, which is highlighted by Prof. Master. Because traditionalists, right, they, they rigidly select uh, traditions from the past to be applied without any context of, of the concrete condition in which it is to be applied. And also, they don't put humans as objects of uh, special attention. As far as they are concerned, the law must be applied, right? Uh, how it affects humans is a secondary matter because laws, they say, are given by God. So they are almost absolute, even though they are the product of human endeavor, but to them, they have elevated these and conceived these laws as, in fact, like almost divine and therefore immutable and cannot be subjected to change, etc. And in the process, of course, they don't value the, the importance of how the law will affect society or, or humans. As far as they are concerned, the sacredness of the law is in its letter and it is in implementation. If there are issues to do with certain problems uh, resulting from the law, those things doesn't come into their purview. So this is the a kind of traditionalist mode of thinking. And furthermore, they take the law as a whole. They don't separate between what are the permanent values uh, underlying the law and its formulations as conditioned by socio-historical circumstances. To them, you cannot dissect the two, right? It's not open to investigation. And therefore, that's the reason often why their law is not compatible with contemporary developments of, of change. So I think he has highlighted very important characteristics. Prof. Mazda has highlighted all these very important characteristics of this inductive paradigm, which is very, very pertinent and very, very important when we are talking about the Muslim law in operation today and its problems. We can't avoid this. 
but there is also i think this this sense that you know uh the the classical traditions they they tend to be how do i say it? like the classical traditions uh are somehow fall into this kind of characteristics which i that part i feel that i'm not totally in agreement i think that uh, the founders of the schools right they were responding to concrete problems of their day and the the, the issue here is that subsequently right subsequently the followers tend to take the contributions of their founders in a way that's isolated and segregated from the context of the thinking of their founders so i think in the early period the the understanding of the muslim law is not like this traditionalism as in the exemplified by the five characteristics that prof mazda has highlighted i think that developed later when change became rapid when they were confronted with changes then this orientation of the elites the amongst the elites which became predominant shaped the understanding of muslim law quite separate from how the founders themselves had dynamically and diversely introduced these laws right? for example i think the maliki school they were not uh, they were not just prone to tradition right but what tradition they regarded as important why they regarded these traditions as important there was conscious rethinking of these issues to make it a source of law whereas later on these became taken out of its context and became like a dogma that we have to subscribe to rather than something that requires rethinking and reevaluation re so i think that's uh, an important uh, aspect that i wanted to add on and i think it's a very good uh, feedback and i'm happy that uh, prof mazda has actually raised that because it also gives me the opportunity to say something that i've missed and i think that there are also uh, areas of common of common uh, um, problems to us right um, because like you know prof mazda says there's not much that can be done uh, there's limited uh, um efforts that can be done to rethink this deductive approach that's predominant in the legal domain partly because of the the the, the elites who are prone to think uh, in that way about the muslim law and the need to to have them on board right in any aspect of change so it's like very hard to come out from this constraints that's why i think in my presentation just now i did try to promote this idea that that one possible way is to think more clearly about the alternative uh you know voice or the alternative um articulation for muslims as citizens of the state in that way right uh the muslim law is not touched whoever wants to do the struggle of rethinking the muslim law and engage theologians from the that tradition and all that it's a challenge but if they think they can do that then there should be no barrier to that but that should not be the only thing available to us i feel that if that is the only option then there's hardly any other alternative open to muslims you know and while this reform is trying to happen right and is a, a lot of challenges there muslims who want that alternative today must have an alternative and that alternative is to allow for a, a, another kind of pathway whereby the state recognize them as citizens eligible to the another system of law the national law if they feel that that national law is not incompatible with with their belief with their religion and their religious beliefs so this doesn't touch on the muslim law whoever wants that classical tradition is comfortable with it or whoever wants to try and reform that tradition they should have that opportunity and that right to do so if they want to subject themselves to that law they should have that right to do so but those citizens who are muslims who do not feel that their faith is is justly served by being bound by that law they should have their right as citizens to that choice of an alternative law this is how i feel the stand uh, this is my stand that i i i i take because i feel that that otherwise there's no option for for the rest and if the tentacles of the 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 elite who wants more and more of a certain type of law they call islamic and that's allowed 
and can have implications on the rights of the individual, all the more that I feel that you know, an alternative must be gi given to those who find issues with these laws, those who feel that this law may not be compatible with their belief in Islam and Islamic law of a different sort. Okay, thank you, Professor. So there is one question yes. to, for Professor and two questions for Prof. Master. But since Prof. Master uh, uh, I don't, maybe don't have uh, time to respond or we, 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 we will complete our discussion of in 15 minute time because it's Friday. So oh, okay. uh, yeah, so uh, I will, if Prof. Mahjar is, is still with us, so uh, there is one question regarding the characteristic of Islamic law on the moderateness of Indonesian Islam compared to any other countries. Uh, but I don't think that Prof. Mahjar <laughs> can uh, have time to respond to our question. So one question from Rudy uh, regarding the uh, what uh, Sido, mm. the 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 influence of Sido. Uh, what is the significance uh, influence of the ratification of the Sido in Singapore to the system of Islamic law in the country, especially in the case of inherited law? So this one to Professor. Yes. Thank you, Rudy, is it, for that question? Yeah. yeah. So, yes, I didn't get a chance to mention that. Uh, as you know, I think Indonesia has completely ratified uh, Article 16 and Article 2. Article 16 deals with uh, equality in the domain of the family law. So, Indonesian state has said yes to Article 16. But in the case of Singapore and even Malaysia, we have not respond. We have not uh, ratified completely Article 16, and uh, there are some some subsections that are um, uh, already ratified, but there are some that are not. And the government in Singapore has not completely ratified Article 16 because they say that they are giving respect to the minority Muslim community because of their personal laws. So, in other words, what the government is saying is that Muslim law is not really gender equal. Uh, as expected by the by CEDO, and therefore you know we can't do very much right uh, to change this law, uh, so we cannot ratify CEDO uh, Article 16, because if you ratify Article 16 and Article 2, it means that the government then will have to ensure right that uh, efforts are being made to create to change the law to make it more gender equal. But what the government has done, even though it has not uh, changed the Muslim law, because like even you know, Prof just now, Prof Master was saying, it's not easy, right, to rethink this law if the dominant elite uh, believe in that kind of uh, deductive approach rather than the inductive approach, or what I will call traditionalists, right? If they are more traditionalistic, of course, then the rethinking of inheritance as more equal, etc., will will be problematic. Cannot get their support. So what the government has done is that where possible, the government has created already pathways for Muslims to seek resolution of their disputes in the, in the civil court. So, for example, right, in the case of inheritance, um, we, you know, like, for example, in the case of, um, you see, Singapore, you see, all this, Mus all this Muslim law, right, all these things that we are talking about, everything has to be concretized to understand the problem that we are facing with the Muslim law, right? So for example, if you take the problem of matrimonial property, a lot of Muslims in Singapore, they purchase property when they are married, right? And this property, unlike in the case of Indonesia, this property takes the form of a public housing. housing. So our houses, if you come to Singapore, most of us live in apartments. Yeah. Yeah, so these apartments are for 99 years and the government subsidized these apartments for us. So we buy the apartments at below the market rate because the government wants everyone to own a house if possible. So when, when two parties buy this house, husband and a wife, they buy it under the common law or the, or the civil law. And this, this, 
This is called joint tenancy. That means if one party dies, the other party will have the right to have that property. So many Muslims buy their homes on this basis, joint tenancy. This is English law, right? civil law. Why do they do that? Because they fear that if they die, right, then their, 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 their wife or their husbands who survive them will not have a roof over their heads. So joint tenancy allows this to happen. Okay? And when you don't have a roof over your head in Singapore, it's very difficult to get another one. Because when you buy the flat with, from the government, when you buy the apartment from the government, the government already subsidized that, the cost of that. The government cannot give you another subsidy if you want to buy another flat later on. So there are all these problems with getting an alternative home when you cannot buy another one and you might not have enough money. So this, this is why we, we adopt the civil law. Then a fatwa was passed in 1998. And this fatwa from the Majlis Agama Islam Singapura stated that joint tenancy is not compatible with Islam because it is against the Islamic law of inheritance. And they say that on the basis of the faraid, the, the, the property must be divided according to the literal understanding of what the faraid is. Sons will get, daughters will get, uncles if no daughters, and all these, all these arrangements, which effectively means that the wife or the husband who outlives the one who has passed away cannot keep that property. That property must be sold and then the proceeds must be divided. So this is very difficult for the Muslim community because... That fatwa makes it difficult because if you sell that house, sometimes you have to hope you become homeless or it's difficult for you to get another house because of state policies. So we have this fatwa that has that create this problem. And now what happened is that the case has gone to the civil court. The civil courts, the higher superior court, have stated that joint tenancy is not a matter for, uh, for the Islamic law, right? Islamic law deals with uh, distribution, not with determination of property. So in that sense, right, we are moving closer towards allowing for equality, uh, which CEDAW expects. Okay? And also other cases can be brought to the family court already, like for example, custody or, and other matters, right? division of property. So hopefully through these pathways, the government is, is allowing Muslims that right but the government still cannot change the Muslim law. So as a result, we are always uh, having a problem whenever the committee, the CEDAW committee meets, the government has to update the CEDAW committee as to how far that Article 16 has been, uh, attempts have been made to ensure green, greater gender equality within the family. And constantly, this is a battle. Okay, and It's not fully resolved yet because of these issues to do with lack of rethinking of the Muslim law in contemporary times. So I don't know whether that answers the question, but I hope it has to some yeah. extent. Okay, thank you, Prof. I have one last question, I think, is regarding okay. the, with all things that Prof. Isa has described and present regarding Islamic law in Singapore. So there is one question from Teddy related to the what kind of istihad that actually Singapore has taken in this case. Uh, mm -hmm. if, we, if we have to if we if we have to make a category about the istihad, what under what category actually uh, reform of Islamic law in Singapore falls? <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good and interesting question. Nobody has written anything about this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think that Singapore uh, community or the, the, I don't think we can clearly see from the judgments and from the thinking that there is a distinct uh, way of ishtihad or there's a distinct mashab that you can call Singapore mashab or something like that. Mm. As you know, the thinking, uh, what, what are the sources of the law that we use is very composite, very mixed. Uh, we use uh, sometimes the Quran, we use Hadith, sometimes we use uh, certain followers of the Shafi'i tradition, sometimes other contemporary scholars are also cited to support the case. So there is some rethinking, but this rethinking is, 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 is uh, you know, um, is going on with, the, with not so much the theologians uh, uh, and also um, 
who are in who are who have leadership over in this domain. I think the rethinking, uh, in terms of the judgments, are going on with with the judges who are from the civil courts who have now become part of the Sharia court. So when they have to think about the the basis for their judgment, they are using many sources, not just from the Islamic traditions but also from the judgments of the civil courts where the, where the material is the same, where the case is the same. So in that sense, I think it's quite unique because our, our Sharia court is also referring to the civil court judgments, you know, using the woman's charter, using the non-Muslim law on matters of custody, on matters of property, etc. We see that they are using the thinking of the civil courts to improve the, the law to make it more in line with contemporary conditions. So, for example, in the in the classical text, uh, custody, uh, the, the the word is hadana, right? Uh, who has that that uh, uh, right over the the child? Okay. So, in Singapore today, you don't hear the word hadana uh, being used by in the judgments of the court. What what the judgments of the courts uh, veer to are, for example, joint Custody. Joint custody is not heard of in traditional Muslim law, right? In traditional Muslim law, you don't have joint hadana, right? But, but here you have, now we are using the term joint custody. So joint custody is, uh, is definitely a new concept. It is a concept developed by the civil court. But because our Sharia court judges who are trained in the civil court now come to serve in the Sharia court are familiar with this concept, and they feel that this concept is not in opposition to general Sharia law principles and objectives. They have taken this concept, and this concept is actually very much more contemporaneous with the times because no longer is the father the sole maker of all the decisions involving the child. The mother is equally now, as, as she gets more educated, etc., more experienced, she is equally an important partner in this union and in her role in parenting. So major decisions affecting children's education, children's health and well-being, right? Whether the child should study here or study elsewhere, what kind of education the child needs, all these major decisions that are related to custodial issues are decided by both. So as a result, right, in Singapore, the civil court have adopted the principle of joint custody. And this joint custody principle and concept is slowly being used by the Sharia court. You see this as an innovation, you know, because it's also ishtihad. They, they use this because they think it's compatible. It's not something they created originally, but ishtihad doesn't mean you need to create everything original. You can also use, right, and you can assimilate good concepts, good traditions, good practices as part of building and strengthening your Sharia to make it more compatible with the times. Okay, thank yeah. you very much, uh, okay. Professor, for the response. And I regret to inform you all that we have to complete our uh, seminar or conference uh, here. Because... It's Friday, so we have yes. to shorten our duration. It should yeah. be three hours, but then uh, the whole time is just uh, for uh, 40 minutes from now. So I have to, okay. we have to finish and complete our conference yeah. uh, up to here. So thank you very much okay. to Professor Aisha for welcome, being Dr. with Pratana. us. Thanks. And we are all happy to have you here. Although thank you only fire uh, virtual meeting so we all pray the uh, pandemic will will be over soon so Shana. we can yes. we can have physical meeting yeah. and uh, do any uh, cooperation and collaboration between department of malay studies Shana. Shana. in Shana. national university of singapore and our department of islamic family law so this yes. is very micro i call it this very micro uh, department in terms of uh, scope we is tell only uh, islamic family law <laughs> but it's very important yeah very yeah. important and more mm. and more uh, problems new problems uh, yes. emerge within our society uh, which only make our 
existence is more relevant to right. to our 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 life in Indonesia. Yes. So sure. once again, yeah. thanks very much to Thank Prof. You so much. and uh, also to our faculty members, our students, and uh, any participant who have been actively involved in this seminar. So let's uh, complete our. A seminar today by reciting Alhamdulillah together. Alhamdulillah alamin. Thanks once again. So let me close by uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Prof. Prof. <laughs> thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. To speak. Inshallah, we will yeah. visit and we will invite you all to yeah. visit us in better times. Sambus ini menyegarkan, nyaman dan inspiratif untuk belajar. Prestasi dari kerjasama internasionalnya sangat luas. Terima kasih banyak. 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 Terima